Chapter 6, My School Assignment That following week, I was at home listening to the radio when I heard something better than any Christmas gift. The National Examinations Board has released the results of this year's Standard 8 exams, the announcer said. I raced into the kitchen to find my mother. My scores, I shouted. My scores are ready. I took off running toward Wimbay Primary, leaping over stones and puddles along the trail, for, for once forgetting about my hunger. I wondered which secondary school I would be attending, Chayamba or Kasungu. Ever since I decided that I wanted to be a scientist, I knew these two schools were the best for me. They had the finest teachers, libraries, and laboratories where a scientist could master his experiments. Of course, I didn't care which one I attended. Wherever those chaps needed me, I'd happily go. A crowd of students was already gathered outside the administration building. I pushed my way toward the front and found the list. The various schools were posted with their respective students slotted below. I quickly found Kasungu and scanned the names. Nothing. Moving toward Chayamba, my fingers scrolled over the names. Kalambo, Kalimbu, then Makalani. Wait a minute, I thought. There must be a mistake. Here you are, Cam Kawamba, said a boy named Michael, who is one of the best students. Your name is here, under Kachogoloko. Sure enough, he was right. But Kachaloko Secondary was probably the worst school in the district. Like Wimbe, it was a community school and very poor. No science programs, no laboratories, just rain through a leaky roof. How can this be, I wondered. Then I saw the exam scores posted on the, ne on the next board. Out of five subjects, I'd only scored one B in Chichiwa, which was the easiest. Everything else was marked C and D. I was going to Chikololo because my grades stunk. My heart dropped in my stomach. I imagined the long walk to Chikolo, about three miles away. It was near a big tobacco farm. A river flowed nearby where Jeffrey Gilbert and I sometimes went fishing. The road was usually filled with mud. Michael slapped me on the shoulder and laughed. Congratulations. If anything, you'll become a great fisherman. The only good thing about Cachoco Loco was that Gilbert was also going. His grades stunk, too. In any case, in two weeks, we'd be walking the long, muddy road together. The new year arrived with steady rains that encouraged our maids to grow. The seedlings had sprouted well without fertilizer and still seemed healthy. By now, their stalks were deep green and reached my father's shins. The rains made everything come alive. All across the region, the flowers bloomed and the forests and bushes blossomed. Everywhere you went, the land smelled rich and fragrant. It was all a cruel joke, of course, because nothing was ready to eat. In the trading center, the businessmen raised the price of maize to 1,000 kwacha per pail. The hungry people who'd long ago turned to eating gaga started getting sick when the traders began mixing it with sawdust. When this was discovered, an angry mob formed around the men. I spent all of my money only to get a belly full of sawdust, one shouted. My children are at home vomiting. You people are criminals. The hungry people could complain all they wanted, but with no money in their pockets, they had no power. Several resorted to crime. One afternoon, my mother arrived as usual with her cakes and set up her stand. Within seconds, a crowd of people descended, shouting and grabbing at her things. I'll take two, a woman said. Give me three, said another. In this chaos, my mother didn't notice that others were snatching cakes from her basin and running away. One man grabbed his cakes grabbed three cakes, but instead of fleeing, he sat down and ate them right there. Nine kwacha, my mother demanded. I don't have any money, he answered. That evening when she returned, her hair was wild and her face full of worry. They took almost everything, she said, and she was right. For supper, there were only crumbs. As the price of maize continued to rise, my mother bought less and less flour. The number of cakes she sold began to shrink, and so did our nightly blob of Nisima. First, it was seven mouthfuls, then five, four, three. Every time you put an esteema in your mouth, add some water, she told us. That way you trick your stomach. At supper, we kids were careful about our portions. We wanted to be fair. But my sister Rose, who was seven years old, became greedy. Often she grabbed large handfuls of esteema and stuffed them in her mouth before anyone could stop her. Hey, slow down, shouted Doris. Maybe you should eat faster, answered Rose. We were all becoming thin, especially the youngest ones like Rose. My parents never scolded her for taking more than her share. But one night, Doris reached her breaking point. 
When Rose grabbed a big chunk of Nasima, Doris leaped across the basin and began punching her in the face. Mama, cried Rose. My mother struggled to pull them apart, then collapsed against the wall. Please, she pleaded. I just don't have the strength. That night, we went to bed hungry again with the smell of food on our fingers, a smell that even the hottest water couldn't wash clean. The worse things got with the famine, the more I looked forward to school. Somehow, being hungry in a classroom full of friends seemed a lot easier than being hungry at home. As the big day approached, I tried my best to get ready. The first problem I encountered was my uniform. Back when we still had money, my mother had sent me to the used clothing stall in the trading center to buy a white shirt. Well, since my wardrobe only consisted of two shirts in total, I ended up wearing the white one a lot and got it dirty. Then we ran out of soap. Back when the troubles began, we'd been using a bar of cheap Maluai Lai soap, which the whole family shared for bathing and washing clothes. When it finally ran out, we were too broke to buy another. We could wash our bodies with warm water and bongo bushes, which acted like sponges, but a white shirt wasn't so easy. I tried everything. I boiled it over the fire, let it soak until the water was cool, then scrubbed until my shoulders were sore. Nothing worked. So I started school with yellow circles around my armpits and a gray ring around the collar. What could I do? That morning, I met Gilbert on the road so we could walk together. Gilbert, Bo! Bo? Sure? Sure. Fit? Fit. My friend, this is the day we've been waiting for. Indeed. We should get ready to be bullied by the older boys. Yeah, I think so. Who do you think will hit us first? That's just it. If an older boy approaches us and he's not too muscular, I say we deal with him straight away. Good plan. So, who should hit him first, me or you? Definitely you. The three-mile walk to Cachacolo took us over the hills and across the maize fields and past the dambos where we hunted as boys. The school sat in a valley surrounded by tobacco farms where I watched tractors plowing a field and the few lucky men with jobs enjoying a day's work. Once at school, we gathered for the morning assembly. Our principal, Mr. W. M. Fury, no relation to the fighter from my father's tall tales, stood before us dressed in a brown, threadbare suit. He was an older man with a bald head except for bushels of gray hair that grew around his ears. Mr. Fury started by saying how happy he was to see such promising students. And he was right. We were a fine-looking bunch, and all of us were so excited to be continuing our education. In Malawi, secondary school was a privilege and an honor. In fact, I was certain that I was experience, experiencing the greatest moment of my life. But like in any institution of learning, he said, this school has rules that must be followed. Every student should be punctual and dressed in the proper uniform. If not, punishment will be swift. After assembly was over, I was walking to class when Mr. Fury tapped me on the shoulder. What's your name, he said. I spun around and froze. William Tyrell Kimkawamba, I muttered, unable to hide my nerves. Well, William, this is not the proper uniform. I threw both hands under my arms to hide the yellow stains, but Mr. Fury was pointing at my feet. Sandals are not allowed, he said. We require students to wear proper footwear at all times. Please go home and change. I looked down at my flip-flops, which had seen better days. The rubber connecting the sole was broken on one of the sandals, forcing me to carry a needle and thread in my pocket for emergency repairs. I didn't have another pair of shoes at home. I had to think fast. Mr. Headmaster, sir, I said, I would put on proper footwear, but I live in Wimbe and must cross two streams to get here. And because it's the rainy season, my mother doesn't want me ruining my good leather shoes in the mud. He scrunched his eyebrows and considered this. I prayed it would work. Fine, he said, but once the rains are over, I want to see you in the proper footwear. My parents didn't have money for school books either. In Malawi, the schools didn't provide learning materials like they do in America. Even in better times, most students couldn't afford to buy their own books and had to share. At Wimbe Primary, that meant squeezing your bottoms together in the same seat and hoping your friend didn't read faster than you. Luckily for me, Gilbert always had his own books and allowed me to look on. The two of us even read at the same level. As I mentioned, the conditions at Wimbe Primary had been terrible. Holes in the roof that let in the rain, no glass in the windows to stop the cold winter wind, lessons held under trees, and of course, I told you the terrible stories about the latrines. 
I was hoping for a better environment at Cochacolo, but no such luck. When Gilbert and I arrived at our new classroom, our teacher, Mr. Tembo, instructed us to sit on the floor. The government sent no money for desks and chairs, he said, looking embarrassed. Or anything else, for that matter. Certainly not for repairs. In the center of the floor was a giant hole where it looked like a bomb had exploded. The walls were chipped and coming apart. A damp breeze blew through the broken windows. And sure enough, when I looked up at the ceiling, I saw a lot of blue sky. To my delight, Mr. Tembo was a kind, soft-spoken man who was patient about the setbacks. Like most teachers in community schools, he lived in a small house next door with his wife and children. His clothes were old and a bit ragged, and the small vegetable garden behind his house could hardly sustain his family. But unlike the farmers, he received a meager salary that allowed for some extra grain during the hunger. Even still, I'd seen his kids in the yard before school, and their arms and legs were as skinny as mine. <laughs> Despite the poor conditions, Mr. Tembo wasted no time starting our lessons. Right away, we began studying history, covering early civilizations in China, Egypt, and Mesopotamia. We learned about early forms of writing and how these cultures communicated with one another. I'd always had trouble in math, but I loved our discussions about angles and degrees and how to use a ruler to take measurements. I remember hearing those words from the builders in the trading center. One afternoon, we began our lessons in geography. Mr. Tembo pulled out a map of the world and asked us to find the continent of Africa, which was easy. Now, can anyone find Malwai? he asked. Yeah, here it is. We ran our fingers lovingly over our country. I couldn't believe how small it was compared to the rest of the world. To think, my whole life and everything in it had taken place on this little strip of earth. On the map, the land was green and the lake appeared like a blue jewel. It was hard to guess that 11 million people lived in that tiny space, and at that very moment, nearly all of us were slowly starving. That week, I realized I'd been wrong. The hunger was just as painful at school as it was at home. All day, my stomach growled and gave my brain no peace, and soon it was too difficult to pay attention. At first, my classmates and I were eager to raise our hands and answer one of Mr. Tembo's questions. A few of us even competed to be the first one called. Kim Kawamba here! Over here, I'd shout. But after two weeks, a silence fell over the room each morning and never lifted. Faces became thinner, and since we had no soap or lotions at home, our skin gradually turned dry and gray, as if dusted in ash. During recess, a few of my friends simply walked off campus to search for food and never returned. None of this mattered anyway. On the first day of February, W.M. Fury made the following announcement at assembly. The administration is aware of the problems across the country which we all face, but many of you still haven't paid your school fees for this term. Starting tomorrow, the free period is over. My worst fear had come true. I knew my father hadn't paid my fees, but who was I kidding? We were eating one meal per day. We couldn't afford to buy a bar of soap, much less pay 1,200 kwacha for my school. Walking home, I got mad at myself for even getting excited and coming in the first place. I'd allowed myself a glimpse of the dream, and now it was crumbling all around. What am I going to do? I asked Gilbert. I have no choice but to face the music. Don't stress, he said. Just go home and see what happens. When I arrived at home, I found my father in the fields. At school, they're saying I should bring my fees tomorrow. 1,200 kwacha, I said, so we should pay them. Mr. Fury wasn't joking around. My father stared at the dirt for a long time, then said, You know our problems here, son. Right now, we have nothing to spare. I'm so sorry. The next morning, I stood by the road and waited for Gilbert. For some reason, I still wore my school uniform, but I wasn't going anyplace. When Gilbert appeared and waved, I let him walk past. What's the matter, he said, turning around. Aren't you coming to school? I wanted to cry. I'm dropping out. My parents don't have the money. Gilbert looked upset, which somehow made me feel better. So sorry, friend. Hopefully they can find it. Yes, perhaps, I said. See you later, Gilbert. I walked down to Jeffrey's house to give him the news. A few weeks before, he'd gotten lucky when a bolt of lightning knocked down a tree in his yard. He'd chopped it into bundles and sold it as firewood along the road. It was enough to keep his family eating for a while, or at least I thought so.
Jeffrey was getting dressed when I entered his room, and the sight of him made me gasp. He'd lost so much weight. His eye sockets were shrunken and dark, but the white parts of his eyes seemed to glow. This is what starving people look like, I thought. They look like ghosts. Why aren't you in school, he asked. Didn't you get selected for Ketchikolo? No money. Today I dropped. Oh, he muttered, then went quiet. Me and you were in the same desperate situation. I hope God has a plan for us. Yeah, I said, me too. In the afternoon, I waited by the road to meet Gilbert as he walked home. When he saw me, he was shaking his head. Almost everyone dropped out, he said. Today, we were few. Out of the 70 students, only 20 remained. <laughs>